inform you of the rundown of this webinar. We will begin with an opening speech from our distinguished speakers. Then we will have two keynote speeches from our honorable keynote speakers. Then we will also have presentations from our distinguished panel of experts moderated by our esteemed moderators. There will then be a question and answer session with all our speakers. For the smooth running of today's event, kindly pay attention to the following rules and regu regulations. Participants are encouraged to have their videos turned on throughout the webinar. Participants should keep their microphones off unless permitted by the moderators. And to obtain a certificate of attendance, participants are required to attend the entire duration of the webinar and fill in a feedback form, which will be distributed at the end of the event. To officially open the, the, this webinar, it is my great honor to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Linda Arnold, as the International Pediatric Association's Coordinator of Development. Without further ado, to Dr. Linda Arnold, the time and screen is yours. Hello, on behalf of the International Pediatric Association, its Strategic Advisory Group on Environmental Health, and our collaborators from UNICEF and WHO, I'm happy to welcome you to today's IPA UNICEF WHO webinar, Preventing Children's Lead Exposure. In celebration of the 10th International Lead Poisoning Prevention Week, our goal is to raise awareness about lead poisoning and encourage all pediatricians to take action to prevent lead exposure in children. Each year, millions of children are exposed to low levels of lead, which is toxic to multiple body systems and have long-term effects on health. Lead is especially dangerous to children's developing brains and can result in reduced intelligence and attention span, behavioral problems, and impaired learning ability. This preventable harm to children's brains leads to a tragic loss of potential. The World Health Organization estimates that 30% of idiopathic intellectual disability can be attributed to lead exposure. There are many sources of lead exposure in industrial set or settings, recycling of electronic waste and batteries, plumbing, and ammunition. Exposure can also occur in non-industrial settings, as lead paint can be found in homes, schools, hospitals, and playgrounds. Children can ingest lead flakes or lead dust from lead painted toys or surfaces, lead glazed ceramics, and some traditional medicines and cosmetics. The world has seen significant use of lead paint in the last 10 years, with more than 84 countries now having legally binding controls to limit the production, import, and sale of lead paints. There's also a global ban of leaded gasoline in place, but there's still much more work to be done. Lead poisoning is entirely preventable, and it's up to us as pediatricians to lead the way in introducing and advocating for measures to restrict the uses of lead and to monitor and manage its exposures. I'd like to thank all of our speakers and our collaborators at WHO and UNICEF, and looking forward to a, a wonderful and informative hour. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Arnold, for your opening remarks. We now invite our second speaker, Dr. Abu Bachar Campo, as the Director of Health Program at UNICEF headquarters to deliver his opening remarks. Without further ado, to Dr. Abu Bachar Campo, the time and screen is yours. Dear participants, I'm Dr. Abu Campo, Director of Health Program Group at UNICEF. As the world's largest children's organization, UNICEF is thrilled to be partnering with the International Pediatric Association. Together, we can help protect children around the world, particularly from environmental pollution, which threatens children's survival, health, and future. Lead pollution alone is harming one in three children globally. Therefore, UNICEF has been working closely with governments and the health sector in countries such as Bangladesh, Georgia, Ghana, and Indonesia to help end childhood lead poisoning. To mark International Lead Poisoning Prevention Week, we are excited to be co-hosting today with the World Health Organization and the International Pediatric Association to discuss the impact of lead pollution on children's health in different country contexts. Only together can we help end childhood lead poisoning. I wish you a fruitful and productive webinar. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Campo, for your opening message. We now invite our third and final speaker, Dr. Maria Nera, as the Director of Public Health and Environment World Health Organization, to deliver the final opening remarks. Without further ado, to Dr. Maria Nera, the time and screen is yours. Say no to lead poisoning. This is the 10th International Lead Poisoning Prevention Week of Action, and this is the theme we have uh, selected. And it's because every year, unfortunately, almost one million deaths occur from exposure to lead. Many more people suffer debilitating and lasting effects. And I'm sure you will agree with me that this is unacceptably high. And children are at particularly vulnerable exposure to lead with irreversible effects on their neurobehavioral and intellectual development. That's why WHO recommends urgent action to eliminate lead exposure. Raising awareness of the many potential sources of exposure is a first crucial step. Exposures can occur in industrial settings, such as mining and smelting operations, and in the manufacturing and recycling of lead acid batteries, electronic waste, paints, glasses, and solder. However, exposure to lead is preventable and unnecessary use can and should be eliminated. Adding lead to petrol has been banned in last year, more than 100 groups from all around the world joined together to draw attention, galvanize action, and share solutions to the problems of lead in paint. 88 countries now have legally binding controls on the production, import, and sale of this dangerous commodity. That's why working together we can achieve a wall without the catastrophic effects of lead in, on the health of our children and future generations. Therefore, let's join forces to say no to lead poisoning. Uh, good afternoon, good morning once again. We have Dr. Maria Nera, who has also joined us in today's Zoom meeting. Thank you very much, Dr. for your inspiring remarks. Thank you very much. I just wanted to say that uh, it's a great honor and privilege for WHO to work with our friends at UNICEF. Uh, this has been a very long uh, collaboration and partnership, and of course, a very rewarding one. And of course, a great pleasure to work with the International Pediatric Association. Just a one message. Not every day we have the possibility to do something so big, so tangible, so concrete, so impactful on public health. So we cannot miss it. We just need to remove lead from pain. And then the health benefits will be enormous. Yesterday we launched a on climate change and the impact on health. And you know how difficult the whole uh, situation is, the whole crisis it is. This is something so concrete, always linked to the environmental determinants of our health. We cannot miss it. So let's join forces and definitely say no to lead exposure, no to lead in pain. And I'm sure that it will be so rewarding the day we will make it. All together we can do it. So please join in forces and make sure that this webinar is all about that, achieving it. Thank you so much to all. Thank you very much, Doctor, for your inspiring message and inspiring remarks to us all as well. It is such a great honor for us to have you join us in our webinar today. And may this webinar be the beginning of a lot of, of further work and collaboration that we can all do together um, as well. As we all have our honorable guests and keynote speakers um, available in the Zoom webinar, we will have a photo session with all our speakers and honorable guests as well. And we will spotlight all our speakers. So if um, doctors, you could turn your videos on. We will uh, we will take this photo together. Uh, 
Uh, we will be taking the photo. Three, two, one. Three, two, one. We also welcome Professor Aman Pulungan as the IP Executive uh, Director who has joined our Zoom meeting as well. Thank you, Professor. We shall now proceed to the next agenda of this webinar, uh, which is the keynote speech from our honorable keynote speakers. Today, we are honored to have the next speaker deliver the keynote speech of today's webinar. We will be sharing her uh, curriculum vitae as well. Dr. Desiree Narvaez, MD, MPH, is the Environmental Health Specialist at the UNICEF headquarters in New York. She has been leading the pollution component of UNICEF's Healthy Environments for Healthy Children. As such, Dr. Narvaez provides technical ca capacities on pollution and children's health, and she represents UNICEF in the Environment Management Group on Pollution. She also coordinates UNICEF's Childhood Lead Reduction Program in four countries. Without further ado, we respectfully invite Dr. Dr. Desiree Navayas to give the keynote speech. To Dr. Desiree Navayas, the time and screen is yours. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. UNICEF is so honored to be participating at this webinar with the International Pediatric Association, having just signed the, the memorandum of uh, agreement with the uh, IPA. It is very much appropriate that we're here in this webinar. So congratulations again to the IPA and so such a pleasure as well to have Dr. Marianera, our key partner, um, WHO, in this work on children's environmental health. UNICEF is actually elevating action on healthy environments for healthy children because every child has the right to a safe, sustainable, clean and healthy environments. It is mandated with the Convention on the Rights of the Child to protect children's health. As such, UNICEF is elevating action on healthy environments for healthy children with ending childhood-led poisoning as a priority. Our IHME data on blood lead levels is very concerning, not to mention the health impact of lead among our children. UNICEF is thus strengthening its advocacy and programming on ending childhood-led poisoning and being present in almost 190 countries and territories, UNICEF is well-placed to step up its efforts on ending childhood-led poisoning. We have developed key messages and videos on lead. This is with WHO. We have um, our own guidance on blood lead level testing. We are providing country support to set up surveillance systems and providing catalytic action for ministries of health to work with ministries of environment in providing the necessary interventions such as policies and legislation, youth advocacy within the primary healthcare system. Jointly with WHO, we are developing an e-learning course, a massive online course on an introductory course on children's environmental health that includes definitely lead. Partnering with WHO and the International Pediatric Association is key to UNICEF's efforts to end childhood-led poisoning. Thank you very much, and I wish you all the best in this webinar. Thank you, Dr. Desiree Narvaez, for your inspiring reminder to us all. It is now my great honor to introduce our second keynote speaker, Ms. Leslie Onion. Ms. Leslie Onion is a toxicologist who has worked for over 25 years in fields relating to chemicals management, poisons information, and occupational environmental health at both governmental and intergovernmental levels. She has recently been appointed as unit head for chemical safety and health in the Department of Environment, Climate Change, and Health WHO headquarters. So, Ms. Leslie Onion, the time and screen is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to join today's webinar to mark the 10th International Lead Poisoning Prevention Week. You join a growing number of committed groups around the world with more than 100 events already have been that have taken place as part of this year's campaign. This is evidence of a high level and continuing commitment and interest among a wide range of governments and civil society stakeholders. And today's webinar organized by the International Pediatrics Association is evidence of your continued interest in reducing the public health burden of lead, particularly in children. The hazards of lead have been known for centuries and WHO itself has long-standing work programs to provide the tools and advocacy for governments to address lead in different media, whether it be air, water or food, or to focus attention on the most vulnerable groups in our society, namely children. 
through its Global Health Observatory, WHO tracks progress in reducing environmental burdens on health and provides a biennial update of progress towards the adoption of legally binding regulations on lead paint. This work shows us that much more remains to be done to increase the intensity and, and, and ambition of the actions needed. But as an example, the need for collective action to stamp out lead in paint was called for in 2009 at, by the government's civil society and industry at the International Conference on Chemicals Management and, and was earlier called for by the World Summit on Sustainable Development in, in 2002. While we have demonstrated significant achievements with almost a 50% increase in the number of countries now having lead, legally binding laws for lead in place, there are still many that lag behind. So this year's International uh, Lead Poisoning Week with the theme of Say No to Lead Poisoning uh, is, is, is very important to continue the momentum to, to stamp out lead in paint, but also to draw attention to the wide variety of sources of lead exposure, which must be also addressed. We are very pleased to be working with both uh, UNICEF and, and UNEP to see how collectively we can give greater attention to reaching the final countries to eliminate lead paint, as well as supporting governments through our respective mandates to raise the ambition to address other sources of lead exposure in a more cohesive way. Our pilot project with UNICEF in Indonesia, for example, is looking at implementing the WHO guidelines for the clinical management of exposure to lead, which were launched at last year's um, International Lead Poisoning Week. Um, in doing this, uh, we will draw on the maternal and child health professionals, as well as those responsible for health and environment. As Desiree mentioned, we also very much look forward in early 2023 to the launch of several e-learning courses for health professionals on children's environmental health and to launch at and I know many of you in your membership has contributed to this to this work. So I, I, on this basis, I also look forward to the future in further strengthening our partnership with the International Pediatrics Association through such activities. Thank you again for taking this initiative during the 10th International Lead Poisoning Prevention Week for engaging your membership on this important issue. And I look forward to strengthening our partnership with the International Pediatrics Association through such activities in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ms. Leslie Onion, for your keynote speech. The next agenda of our webinar will be moderated by a very special and distinguished moderator. It is my great honor today to introduce our moderator for this webinar. Professor Elif Osmart is a professor of pediatrics in Hasadabi University Faculty of Medicine Department of Pediatrics. She is currently the director of Hasadabi University Institute of Child Health and the Deputy Secretary General of Turkish National Pediatric Society since 2015. She is also the author of more than 180 international national articles or book chapters. Her specific areas of research and studies include nutrition, environment development, and developmental disorders. And after the Syrian refugee crisis in Turkey, she is also actively working in the area of refugees within the Turkish National Pediatric Society. Without further ado, to Professor Osmar, the time and screen is yours. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction, and I would like to welcome you all to the uh, IPA WHO collaboration prevention of lead exposure in children uh, that has been performed during the International Lead uh, Poisoning Prevention uh, Week. Well, uh, I'd like to thank very much for the Kenya uh, speakers and also uh, for the introduction uh, for the speakers that I have also mentioned about the huge problem and that the problem is just starting uh, during the childhood period. And now I would like to just emphasize that it, in fact, it is uh, starting during the uh, intrauterine period because we know that the current or the previous exposure of the mother uh, will affect the blood that level of the baby because it has been uh, just stored in the body of the mother in especially in the bone and that will be mobilized and passed to the uh, baby later on especially uh, due to the activities of the children and due to the uh, differences of children being a baby or a child they are at increased risk and also a special risk for the infants is related with the infant formula, especially if they have been prepared with a uh, high lead content uh, water uh, either from any uh, slumming or things like that, or due to lead pipes. 
Then later on, as it has been just discussed a lot, the lead paint chips uh, and also uh, the gasoline, uh, which has uh, lead or the dust or the soil consumer products, would also uh, make risk for the children uh, for lead uh, exposure. And then that will come the adult activities that will uh, increase uh, lead exposure, both for the uh, adults and for the baby as well. So uh, yes, it has health effects. If we just go on the second uh, slide, please. Yes, it has health effects and especially we have the health effects uh, in children and the neurobehavioral effects are very important. They have been already uh, demonstrated. We have the high evidence and uh, we just uh, have to accept that there is no safe level of lead exposure uh, for children and also uh, for children. So the main idea, as it has been presented before for by the other speakers, uh, we say no to any kind of lead exposure. And it only does not have uh, effects for the young children and for neurobehavioral effects, but also uh, it affects the kidney, the liver, uh, the blood and the reproductive uh, system. So there will be also an effect of transgenerational uh, lead levels and the health effects of the uh, lead. Well, uh, just not uh, wanting to take more time from the other speakers, uh, I would just uh, like to go on uh, with the speakers. The, uh, our most esteemed speakers will be just uh, talking about the uh, situation in different uh, regions of the world. And the first speaker I would uh, like to introduce is Professor Stefan Bosse O'Reilly. He is a pediatrician and professor for public health and environmental medicine at the University Hospital Munich, Germany. And he works for the Institute and uh, for Outpatient for Clinic for Occupational, Social and Environmental Medicine, leading the unit for global environmental health and climate change. For the 20 years, he has been conducting research on environment and health in the context of international and national uh, projects, and he's particularly interested in the issue of mercury exposure among the gold miners. He has worked for the United Nations Industrial Developmental Organization and WHO uh, in Philippines, Tanzania, Indonesia, Zimbabwe, Ecuador, Mongolia, and he is the consultant for the World Bank in Philippines, Tanzania, in Zambia to reduce lead exposure among children in old mining area. He is a member of the chair board of the International Network Children's Health Environment and Safety and a member of the German uh, Professional Association of Pediatricians and Adolescents uh, and the German Academy for Prevention and Health Promotion in Childhood and Adolescents. His main interest is to prevent children from disease by helping to optimize the policy science interface, especially in his zone of knowledge, children's environmental health. Uh, now the uh, stage is yours, Professor Bose O'Reilly. Hello, everybody. Thank you for this very, very nice introduction. And I will come with a case example. I will bring you to one of the project sites I'm working in as a consultant to World Bank. So we go to Zambia. In Zambia, you know, it's in the Southern Africa here. Oh, sorry. So here we are. We are in Zambia, and in Zambia is a big town called Kapwe, and in Kapwe is a highly polluted town, which I will show in a few pictures. Mining of zinc and lead occurred there for decades. And so this is a historical picture of an old mining town in the 1930s. And this is a processing plant which is operating since decades and still operating again. There are old tailing hills, the huge tailing hills, they're all full of tailing, con still containing a lot of lead. And as you can see, they're uncovered, they're not protected, these tailing hills. So the wind can blow this dust into the housing areas. So it's a highly polluted area and it's called the lead hotspot. And here you see on the last slide, some kids in the surrounding playing. So this is next to these mining areas. So we have a lot of kids exposed in, in this part of the world. 
Here on this slide, you see the tailing hill as such, and in red, you see the very high levels of lead in soil. And then you see, especially where the wind is blowing into this direction, that there's still increased levels of lead in the different townships. Does this have an impact on kids, was the question. And yes, as I will show, it does. So the problem comes from this uncovered old tailing hill. And then it's outside of the rainy season. It's very dry, very dusty here. And here, they, some kids just next to this road, or these kids are just running around without any shoes in this dust. So there's a way of exposure. Why are these children at high risk? Because the children's nervous systems are still developing. Young children have more hand to mouse activity than older children. And children absorb about four times more lead than adults do. Here is a few results. These are results from the two, year 2003 to 2012, for example. These are the different townships. And here is the scale from 10 to 45 microgram per deciliter lead. And at the moment, we say a level about five microgram per deciliter should cause some action. So all, all the different uh, townships had increased mean levels of blood lead. 95% to be uh, giving more details. These are two of the main exposed townships, Cassandra and Makululu. Here's it once again in microgram per deciliter. And here you see, you know, the percentage of children within these areas. And 45 microgram per deciliter is the recommendation above which you should start a treatment to lower down the blood lead levels with an antidote. So about a high amount of children is in this area uh, requiring treatment. It was about 50% at this time when we looked at the data. And, you know, here you see children with levels way above 100. And this is the area where, you know, children can die even due to lead poisoning. So these children are really at a very high risk. This is a, a more updated study from the year 2020. Here's the tailing hill. Here you see the surrounding houses. And then you still see in the soil these red dots that next to the tailing area, the soil levels are very high. So if you look at those children, for example, the highest lead levels, mean lead levels or median lead levels is at the age of two, when they really crawl around, when they have a lot of hand to mouse activity. So children still have very high lead levels. We did a study as well. We just did a different way of analyzing Existing data was a spatial analysis, and this is once again this tailing area. These are these different places, and here you see in red we find clusters of high lead levels. And further away or different uh, wind direction, the levels are not as high as they are. But in these distinct hot spots, the mean levels were above 50 microgram per deciliter. So the local health centers there, they are screening the kids nowadays in a program and they were screened already more than 10,000 kids and 1,500 had high blood lead levels requiring treatment, but the lead exposure on these dusty roads is still the same. The tailing hill is not covered yet and the children still run around like this. So there's still a very high exposure. What is the perspective from us as pediatricians? Large proportions of children are highly exposed and high to extremely high blood lead levels. The individual lead exposure relates to the environmental contamination of the area caused by the old lead and zinc mining activities. And according to threshold levels and international recommendations, children need to be treated. The medical treatment already started. The environmental rehabilitation is lagging behind. And most important is it, of course, to reduce the exposure considerably in these intoxicated, contaminated areas. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. O'Reilly, uh, for the situation in Zambia and it re nearly reads 
needs urgent uh, prevention to be done. Now, uh, I would like to introduce our next uh, speaker, Professor Tudan uh, Lucien Pop. Uh, he's working as a consultant in pediatrics and pediatric gastroenterology and a full professor in pediatrics at the University of Medicine and Pharmacy, Lully Hatienga Club Napoca, Romania. Uh, from where he has graduated in 1995. His clinical work is in pediatric gastroenterology, mainly in hepatology. He obtained his PhD studying the, automat the autoimmunity associated with chronic viral hepatitis in children. The main research areas are cholestatis, hepatitis, metabolic liver disorders, acute liver failure, and non-invasive evaluation of the liver. He is the coordinator of the Center of Expertise in Pediatric Liver Rare Disorders uh, in Romania, and he is active in social pediatrics, teaching maternal and child health at uh, Kleist School of Public Health and University of Klaj Napoca, Romania. Since 2019, he has been acting as a member of the council and chairman of the Scientific Educational Projects Committee of European Pediatric uh, Association and Union of National European Pediatric Societies and Associations. Since 2021, as the representative of the uh, European Pediatric Associations in IPA, a strategic advisory group on environmental health, and he is going to uh, tell us about the situation in Romania from the past to the present. Please, uh, Dr. Kov. Join this uh, webinar. I would like to present in the following minutes the uh, experience from Romania, some data from uh, Romania from past to present. We know that uh, Romania is a Eastern European country, and since 1989 we had important economical and social changes. Before we had the heavy industry and uh, mining activity, and uh, for the last 15 years as a member of EU, we have to complain a lot of uh, rules and regulation policies for public health that uh, change uh, very much the situation of uh, lead exposure. But before discussing the lead exposure in Romania, I'd like just to mention the important differences between Western and uh, Eastern European countries regarding lead uh, poisoning and lead exposure due to mainly due to uh, phasing out of the lead from uh, petrol and uh, industrial emission. And we can see here from a data from data since 1927, uh, uh, we have here data from Bulgaria, Macedonia, Romania, Russian Federation, Poland with uh, in high uh, blood level of the, of the um, lead compared to country from the Western part of Europe as France, Israel, France, Germany, and Sweden. And we can see here the situation in Germany where during the last 40 years, there was a big decrease of these uh, levels. And this uh, uh, was followed by, uh, in also in uh, Eastern countries. Regarding the lead exposure in Romania, we can find the lead uh, widespread in all areas of the country, mainly due to road traffic and also industry where we have industries and um, mining areas. The main exposure for our country is the same as for other parts of the world due to soil and house dust and the uh, sources of water and food. But for the last 15, 20 years, we had to comply to a lot of uh, rules and regulation that uh, changed the situation. So we had to phase out the use of leading gasoline since 2005. Also, we had um, the policies and um, legislation for um, uh, lead compounds in paints and also for the health and safety of workers in 2006. But uh, Historically, we had three main areas in Romania with uh, a bad situation. In the north of Romania, Bayamare, we, uh, with three companies, Kopsha Minka and Zladna. These are the three hotspots for uh, lead uh, exposure. And I will discuss for uh, each some data. Kopsha Minka probably is the most polluted city in Romania and also, I think, in uh, Europe. Here is the only active company specializing in non-ferrous metallurgy, but uh, for the last... Uh, maybe 10, uh, 20 years, 10, 50 years, there were some actions taken for cleaning the area and minimizing the environmental hazards. There are some studies that showed in 2002, a level of BLL around 40, 44, very high. And uh, this study showed that the, the, the high level is correlated with the times played spent by the children playing outside. 
here in Kopshamika, since 2002 to 2009, there was an uh, intervention program implemented for children 4 to 15 years. And by this um, uh, program, the level decreased from 46 2002 to 22 in 2007 and 16 in 2009. So during a seven year of um, uh, program, there was an important decrease of the BLL in uh, children. And uh, also the study shows some correlation be, uh, with the, some behaviors, dirty hands to, to, to mouse and uh, the way of cleaning the house. The same thing was uh, found also in Bayamare. Bayamare is in the north of Romania. Here we had three industrial companies as source of pollution. Um, we have uh, now a decline of industrial activity and all of them, maybe just one remained open, the others two were closed. And this is the way, one way of uh, reducing the pollution in this area. But the soil rest, rest uh, remain contaminated with lead, copper, zinc and cadmium. In 2002, a study showed a high level of BLL of around 60. It's very, very high for children. And again, the link with behaviors like hand washing, cleaning of the house, eating vegetables, playing with soil, and also the family income. In 2015 here, it was a study looking to the water sources and the only water source with a high level of lead was the one around the old factory from one neighborhood in the, in, uh, near the old factory. Slatna is the third um, hotspot uh, in Romania. Here we had a program in uh, 1994 to 1997 from USAID project. And this program uh, trying to reduce lead exposure for children by reducing the exposure, improvement air quality monitoring and improvement of the occupational health and safety at that smelter. The smelter was closed definitely in 2003 but uh, remain also with, uh, with um, contaminated soil. But this program during just in three years um, led to a reduction in, of 25% of BLL from 40 to 28. Some other recent data showed uh, level, um, lower level uh, after 2005, due, maybe due to phase out of the leading gasoline in uh, Bucharest uh, 3.2. And uh, near Bucharest in a city near a metal processing plant 4.1, but compared to level that were before in uh, to, before to, in around 2000, it's a decrease. But uh, there is a study that show uh, the link with uh, high traffic road, it, uh, the link with the uh, um, lettuce and uh, leafy vegetables. Also other factors that are uh, related to the uh, Lead exposure was parent education, uh, pika phenomenon, also food like lamb, watermelon, called the breakfast or fruit juice produced in Romania coming from area with um, soil that remain polluted. So in our country, we had all of these measures to reduce the risk of exposure. Mainly it's uh, an important um, place should be the regulation and the policies to reduce the uh, exposure for workforce. Here in Romania, we had only 1.3% uh, of worker, workforce exposed, but the removing of lead from petrol, from food containers, medicine, cosmetic, water pipes, identification of population at risk of exposure. We can discuss here about, of um, also pottery making and use of paint in ceramic dishes. We had a case that was published in uh, from Transylvania uh, with, um, lead exposure from pottery making and important monitoring and restricting the access to contaminated area. All these measures should be active measures. The measures uh, should be, uh, should lead to awareness, increase awareness in population in exposed area, educational programs for children, family and communities, and most important regulations, policies and uh, rules. All these measures were proved to be effective in many countries in Europe. We, can, we saw here in Romania also uh, an important improvement for the last 20 years. And I think we have to use the experience of others to improve the situation of lead exposure worldwide. Thank you very much.
thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Pop, uh, for the uh, presentation uh, from the past to the present and just demonstrating how the measures taken, how the appropriate measures taken were effective in preventing and decreasing uh, lead exposure in uh, children. Now we will go on with the uh, next speaker, uh, Professor Ramesh Bajania, and he has been uh, a pediatrician uh, since the last 24 years in Ahmedabad. Uh, and from that beginning, he was just interested in uh, academics and special interest in environmental uh, issues and neonatology. Uh, he has been the secretary for the group of environmental uh, child health, national environmental child health uh, group uh, in the Central Indian Academics of Pediatrics for the year 2019 uh, and 2021. Uh, and they have uh, just prepared the environment friendly uh, conference uh, and also he has been the organizing secretary uh, for the annual conference of the environmental uh, child uh, health. Uh, he is also a member of the humanitarian and disaster uh, relief. Uh, he is a member of the Antibiotic Week celebration uh, and he is the organizing secretary of the Association of the Guajak Annual Conference since 2010. Uh, and he is a, he's privileged to be a faculty at the National Conference of the Central Indian Academy of Pediatrics since the last 10 years. Uh, he has been associated with Balshaka Tree Scheme of a government to reduce neonatal mortality rate and he is able to contribute in various social activities. Uh, Professor Ramesh Bajani you will tell us about the situation in India. Uh, the stage is yours, please. So uh, UNICEF and uh, Pure Earth report titled Toxic Truth. It uh, showed that nearly 800 million children in the world are affected by lead poisoning. But uh, India alone contributes to more than 275 million. So it's a huge uh, figure. This uh, shows the uh, source of uh, lead poisoning. Uh, I'll not repeat uh, the things which uh, previous speakers have narrated. Lead is a cumulative toxicant and that affects multiple body systems and is particularly harmful to young children. The more or less the contributors to lead exposures are the uh, same, but uh, a few things are specific to India and Asia. First, lead informal and substandard recycling of lead acid battery. As you know, there is a threefold increase in number of vehicles since 2000, and up to half the lead acid uh, batteries used in these vehicles were recycled in informal economy. Uh, 700 to 7 50,000 metric tons of lead are recycled each year. And there are new hotspots of contamination. The uh, most worrisome thing is because due to legal problems, they keep uh, these melting sites as uh, melting sites changing. The break open battery case, speed acid and lead dust in this soil, and then it is spilled in open air furnaces. According to a study uh, by Dr. Abbas Mahdi, the children living near this area, they showed uh, up to 190 micrograms per deciliter. This is a typical uh, smelting uh, scene. Water is uh, another source of poisoning. In uh, one study at Jodhpur, uh, the western city of India, uh, had high PV content of 250 PV uh, against uh, environmental protection agency advocated 50 MP. Then the fog remedies and cosmetics containing uh, lead, they are uh, more in Asia and uh, especially in India. They are used by many households. Gasad and Indian folk medicine in the form of a brown powder, which is used as a tonic. Sindhu, typical Indian woman, they wear a permedium, a traditional cosmetic powder, again, rich in uh, lead. But concoctions with extreme concentrations most likely had metals intentionally added as a part of practice called Ras Shastra. Because Ayurvedic practitioners, they said that heavy metals can increase the potency of an Ayurvedic mixture. And then this basma is put through a complicated process, sometimes involving God's urine and other acidic liquids that are said to detoxify heavy metals. Uh, cosmetics like coal and surma are rich in lead and hence potential uh, cause of lead uh, toxicity. Usage of herbal folk medicines along with surma coal usage also observed in children showing more than 5 microgram per deciliter of uh, lead. 
And one more medicine, Mayo, Rajagogulu, for high blood pressure, it has also been found to have significant amount of lead. No one has actually good handle on the exact prevalence of use because it is underreported. As doctors don't generally ask and uh, parents, uh, they don't report it. But the use of folk medicine is rooted in generation, old cultural traditions, Ayurvedic uh, medicine, for example, originated 2000 years ago in India, where 80% of the people, they use it. And moreover, people think that, well, my grandmother has used it, so it's uh, not a problem. It is extremely hard to change the cultures and beliefs. Uh, some Ayurvedic preparations have been found to contain lead and or mercury 100 to 10,000 times greater than acceptable limits. Uh, lead paint, we know it is more in an older house, especially when peeling occurs. There are laws against uh, lead paint for industrial uses uh, since 2015, but still uh, many substandard companies, they get away with it. Uh, all Asians are very fond of spices and uh, food items like chili powder, garam masala and a particular brand of uh, uh, instant noodles have been found to contain lead. And as uh, children are exposed to toys, uh, again, it uh, forms a very important source. It is well uh, documented that uh, lead is more readily absorbed in the presence of uh, malnutrition and iron deficiency anemia. So early detection and treatment of both co this condition is important. As we can see from this slide, particularly paint in homes built before 1978, lead contaminated soil. I won't go into the details. These are the uh, uh, roots of uh, innovation, ingestion, again, have been found. Now, uh, lead has been found in uh, some traditional uh, medicines. Uh, they add herbs, minerals, metals, or animal products. Uh, lead and other metals are um, deliberately put into it because they are thought to be uh, useful in treating some elements. Or they accidentally seeps into it uh, during grinding or coloring or packaging. Uh, the ironically, parents often give these substances to their infants and children, considering that it helps in their growth and development or to treat them again uh, minor illnesses. And this most of the time, these uh, medicines are procured from their relatives and friends, and they do not suspect that uh, it could be harmful. If uh, symptoms persist, they make even larger amounts inadvertently causing uh, further illnesses. Now, by having the medicine tested in a laboratory, only one can say that it contains uh, lead or not. Most of the medicines are used for arthritis, infertility, upset stomach, menstrual cramps, etc. And as we know, Ayurvedic is a Medicine is a traditional system uh, native to India. These are the common scenes. If you go uh, to any part of India, then you'll find uh, this uh, Ayurvedic products on the shelf of any pharmacy shop. This is, uh, she's preparing Bhasma again, very uh, rich in lead. Uh, the problem is there are very few studies and uh, most of them, they are relatively of small sample size. Though uh, now uh, there's uh, many studies are going on, but as they are, as they are uh, to be published, so couldn't get uh, the data from them. Uh, 1989 National Family Health Survey was the first to provide information to VLS in children less than three years of age in two major cities. And uh, results showed that 50% of uh, Mumbai and 45% in Delhi had uh, VLS more than 10 micrograms per deciliter. Again, uh, this report by uh, Indian government, Niti uh, uh, found that the highest health and economic burden was posed by lead poisoning. Uh, it costed 5% of the Indian GDP and caused 2.3 lakhs premature deaths in the country. The major uh, states were Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, Jharkhand, etc. And the report called for the implementation of national and state level uh, policies. Uh, these include identification of at risk population through BLL monitoring finding the uh, sources of spike in BLLs and sensitization of healthcare workers. And it also recommends conducting targeted research and intervention to identify new sources of lead poisoning. Uh, in one study, there were uh, various uh, mean of BLL varied in different cities of Lucknow, Nagpur, Delhi, Kolkata in uh, different uh, studies. Uh, prevalence of elevated BLL is high in children of Indian southern and coastal cities. This might be due to because they are software hubs and there were high amount of lead containing electronic waste. So uh, this should be properly handled, decomposed and uh, children be kept away from dumping or recycling sites. The mass screening of elevated BLL in children is required by opting a lower cutoff value of BLL 5 microgram per deciliter to reduce its longer effect on neurobehavioral function. One study was carried out at Jodhpur 
and it showed that VLL was higher in children of illiterate mothers and near traffic dense areas. And almost 19% of school going children had VLL more than 5 microgram per deciliter. Uh, one more meta analysis was by uh, Dr. Brett Eric Sona, and uh, it showed VLL of 6.86 microgram per deciliter even after uh, eliminating lead from the petrol. So, this is uh, worrisome. And uh, it resulted in 4.9 million dairies. So, large population wide VLL studies are required to form future calculations. This uh, study by Dr. Nitin B. Jain and Howard, who showed uh, the uh, um, uh, coal and uh, traditional folk medicines. Most children, 76%, had BLS between 5 and 20 microgram per uh, year. A low standard of living correlated with a 32.3% increase in BLS. And uh, the conclusion was that the correlation between greater than 95th percentile weight upon height and higher BLS may reflect an impact of lead exposure on body habitus. It might be affecting by uh, disturbing the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal uh, axis. And the uh, last paper uh, showed uh, the uh, blood le levels children using traditional Indian folk medicines and cosmetics. And here, coal users had a statistically significant higher BLL than non users. So, further research is needed to investigate whether Ayurveda and coal use are risk factors for elevated lead burden among Indian children. So, uh, finally, coming to an uh, Henrietta Ford, UNICEF executive director in a press statement said that with few early symptoms, lead silently wakes havoc on children's health and development with possibly fatal consequences. Knowing how widespread lead pollution is and understanding the destruction it causes to individual lives and communities must inspire urgent action to protect children once and for all. And WHO calls upon all countries to ban lead paint, identify and eliminate all sources of childhood lead exposure, educate the public regarding the dangers of misusing lead containing products and say no to lead poisoning. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Bajain, thank you. Professor Bajain, thank you very much for the presentation uh, for the situation in India. And we see that both the uh, common sources as paint or leaded gasoline, but also some traditional uh, sources and maybe emerging sources like the electronic waste uh, has just come up uh, as important sources. Thank you very much. And now I would like to go on with our last uh, speaker, Professor Salman uh, Morey. Uh, he is currently a professor at the Department of Pediatric and Adult Medicine at the American University of Beirut. He graduated from the American University of Beirut Faculty of Medicine and completed his training in the United States in pediatrics and then in pediatric pulmonary diseases at Georgetown and then Duke University Medical Centers. He is American board certified in pediatrics and pediatric pulmonology. Dr. Moray is a former president of the Lebanese Pediatric Society and of the Union of Arab Pediatric Societies. He has a special interest in environmental influences on children's health in general and on their respiratory health in particular. Uh, now the stage is yours, Dr. Salman Moray, for the situation in Lebanon. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Osmer. Now, uh, so I'll be talking about lead exposure in Lebanon. Now, Lebanon, you, may, you know, is a small country on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean. It has an area of uh, 10,000 square meter and a population of about 6 million and, uh, and 750,000. Uh, we have not had any really any regulations that uh, attempted to limit lead exposure beside, except for uh, 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 a ban on lead on uh, leaded gasoline back in January of uh, 2002. Before that, there was a law that was passed in 1998 that uh, meant to regulate the disposal of toxic waste in general. And it had a long list of hazardous pollutants, lead was one of them. So uh, in two th as of uh, 2002, people have been using uh, unleaded gasoline. And before that, 90% of the vehicles were operated on uh, leaded gasoline. And since then, uh, people uh, have stopped importing leaded gasoline. And uh, subsequently, we feel that most of the gasoline that is being used is unleaded. Now about the prevalence of, uh, of uh, prevalence uh, 
about studies about the prevalence of lead exposure, we have two studies conducted in children. One of them was conducted in 1997-1998 on a sample of 500 children, one to three year old in the Beirut area. And it showed that 14% of the children had blood level uh, levels, blood lead levels above 10 microgram per deciliter and 79% above five microgram per deciliter. Another study was conducted in 2019-2020 on uh, 90 children here. This was a smaller study, one to six year old in the same area. And it showed that none of them had blood level, uh, blood lead levels above five uh, microgram per deciliter. And both studies attempted to identify risk factors for these high levels. Now, the sources of lead here are the leaded gasoline, the paint, tap water delivered by lead soldered pipes, glazed pottery, canned food, traditional medicine, and recreation firearms. So these are mostly what other studies have shown. Now, we don't have any really any heavy industries or any mining that would account for environmental exposure to lead. Now, uh, going back to leaded gasoline, as I mentioned, we have banned lead, leaded gasoline as of 20, uh, 2002. And in the previous, in the first study, the 1997-1998, living in a traffic jammed area was strongly associated with elevated blood lead uh, levels. And it more than quadrupled the children's risk for an elevated blood lead level. And the drop uh, seen in the second study may have been a direct effect of the ban on leaded gasoline. Uh, now for the paint, uh, lead compounds are colorful and are widely used. And uh, as uh, people have been starting, started putting uh, limits on lead content uh, from the 1970s on. However, it remains that uh, old paint contains lead and chipping old paints, particularly from old houses, is a major source of uh, lead exposure. And in the studies that were done here, having ever resided in a house older than 40 years was associated with a significantly higher blood lead level. And in Lebanon, there have not been any regulations or any legislation to ban lead uh, from paint. And uh, although uh, recently manufactured uh, lead paints are labeled lead free, they may still contain high lead levels. This is a study that was published in 2015 that looked at the lead content in some countries, including uh, Russia, Paraguay, and Lebanon. And uh, this is looking particularly at uh, yellow, white, and red. These are the paints that contain the highest amount of, of lead. And you can see now, uh, now considering that the legislation aimed aim to ban uh, uh, lead content of more than 90 uh, parts per million in lead. And you can see here, even in, uh, in uh, lead that is labeled free of lead or lead free, the, 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 con the concentration of lead can be as high as near uh, 32,000 or so. As we said, and the legal limit is uh, in, in the USA and Canada is 90 ppm. In Europe, it is 600 ppm. So we are, the pain that we are using now as of 2015 is still much higher in my attrition in lead than it should be. Now, uh, tap water. Uh, now, tap water was traditionally delivered in lead soldered pipes. Now, most people are using uh, polyvinyl uh, chloride pipes. However, living in older houses, increasing the exposure to lead from these pipes, especially if they are decaying. And this is, remember, the, the Flint water crisis in the US. So, again, as we said, uh, living in older houses is a high risk factor for uh, high lead levels. Other, uh, other uh, risk factors are using glazed pottery and canned food. Now, most pottery glazing contains lead, which comes in contact with food. And the traditional kitchenware in, in Lebanon and in most of the area here was made, uh, was used for cooking and serving food. And it is, uh, as we said, uh, rich in, it contains lots of uh, lead, but it is rarely used nowadays. So now we rely more on melanin or porcelain or etc. that do not contain that much lead. And also lead soldered food cans 
are not being used anymore. So these are, although traditionally listed, there are no risk factors for lead exposure. Uh, other traditional medicines, now Dr. Mashania uh, talked a lot about these. Now, uh, both studies listed the use of traditional medicines as a, as a risk factor for elevated blood lead level. Now, unfortunately or unfortunately, uh, we don't know what these traditional medicines are and what they contain. So we cannot determine what, how and why they are contaminated with lead. However, uh, Kohl is, a, is a frequently used as an eyeliner and a mascara and applied even to new walls. This is a picture from the internet that shows here uh, a young child where uh, Kohl was applied, uh, applied. And it is made of lead sulfide and it, uh, it is absorbed through the skin and through the nasolacrimal duct, and it goes into the blood uh, and elevates the, lead, the blood lead levels. Uh, finally, recreation firearms. Now, this is something that uh, the other speakers did not mention, but a number of studies have shown that the exposure to recreation firearms has been associated with elevated blood lead levels. And according to our more recent, most recent study, the 2020 2021 study, children whose caregivers were involved in recreation firearm use were 6.1 times more likely to have an above median firearm. So, this is something that one should talk about. Uh, and uh, now that people have been talking about uh, banning firearms, so this is one factor one should consider. In conclusion, lead exposure re remains prevalent despite banning regulation. Reducing this exposure may require education, just as we mentioned, about the toxic effects of lead and lifestyle changes. So it is not only regulations, it is education and education. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Mora, for this uh, presentation about the situation in Lebanon. And as you have mentioned, yes, uh, some of the regulations have uh, caused an effect to decrease uh, lead exposure and lead levels, but still there are lots of things to be done, maybe both by the parents and by the uh, politicians and, of course, by the uh, scientists. Uh, now, uh, I would like to go on with the question and answer session. We have just asked uh, you for your questions uh, before while you are uh, registering for the uh, webinar. Uh, and I believe that uh, most of those uh, questions have been answered uh, during the presentations uh, of our speakers. Uh, but maybe we can just uh, go over some of the uh, questions uh, to be uh, clarified uh, by our speakers uh, once again. So uh, Professor uh, Moray has uh, at the end uh, concluded that uh, not only uh, the regulations, but also uh, the education is uh, important Important. So uh, I would like to direct the question to Professor uh, Pop. Uh, is it the duty of the parents uh, to keep the children away from lead exposure? How much the parents uh, are responsible for that? And uh, what else uh, can you comment on this question? Uh, the stage is yours, Dr. Pop. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that the parents are important because they are most close to the children, but we, we don't have to let them alone in this fight because the um, parents and the community should uh, be educated. There should be programs for increased awareness of risk of exposure. Um, the parents should be educated how to prevent and how to have uh, their children with uh, healthy behaviors to prevent the lead exposure. But most uh, more important than the parents should be the community, should be the society, even the pediatrician in the area where we have uh, increased exposure to uh, lead. They should uh, fight for their pa patients. They should fight to impose some programs for monitoring the BLL and to have a safe environment for them. Also, the schools should fight for safe environments for children. For example, schoolyards that are in uh, exposed area should be protected because uh, the children spend a lot of time in school and in um, uh, outdoor maybe. Also, I think more important at all that we discuss here are the, is the society. The society through their representative, through the government, the health ministries, to different NGOs. I think in many parts of the world, the NGOs are more active than uh, the government. 
because they should impose uh, legislation, policies on public health rules, and more important than impose these um, rules and regulations should be to monitor how these are enforced and applied. All of this should be done in order to decrease um, the pollution coming from industry and mining activities where this is uh, present, but also to decrease the lead exposure from other sources. We saw here a lot of sources of lead exposure. So not only the parents, all the society should, uh, should be involved in this uh, reduction of lead exposure. And uh, we saw there are measures that worked in some place of the world, and I don't know why we should not use all these measures everywhere in the world. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, maybe we can just once more go over uh, the common source of lead exposure, although uh, most of the speakers have just mentioned about the most important uh, sources uh, in their country. Uh, and how would you comment on this uh, question, uh, Professor Bajanya? Uh, mainly uh, the uh, paints in homes, especially uh, built uh, before 1978. So there are uh, routes. Uh, it can be through inhalation, it can be through ingestion, or it can be through direct contact. Uh, then there is a, like in older schools or older house, the lead contaminated soil is there. Then uh, traditional remedies and cosmetics, uh, what we uh, discussed. Uh, imported pottery, laced, uh, eating in that uh, utensils, uh, and imported toys, uh, especially Chinese toys, imported jewelries, imported candies. These are uh, known uh, source, uh, uh, mainly uh, in uh, uh, all over the world, the sources are more or less say, uh, like uh, 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 acid batteries, uh, then uh, this uh, uh, paints, then water coming through older pipes, uh, then the traditional uh, remedies and uh, cosmetics like this specific to, more specific to Asia and India, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, we have a ban on lead in gasoline, but uh, there are other fuels uh, that may contain uh, lead. Uh, and how uh, about the exposure to those uh, fuels? Uh, can you just comment, uh, comment on that, Dr. Uh, Morrow? And also, uh, we want to learn why lead is used in paint. Now, the major source of, of lead really was the gasoline used in cars because people have discovered that it is uh, it makes the engines run better now they have other other alternatives however aviation flu, uh, fuel 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 is still using uh, is still leaded so this is one source of exposure now the other fuels for example diesel fuel which is uh, more toxic between quotation marks than than uh, gasoline is not leaded so the other fuels may have other problems, but they are not a source of, of lead exposure. Really. Uh, now, why is lead used in paint? Because it gives a fresher look, it gives a better look, and it is more durable, it resists more moisture, and it speeds drying. So it has a number of advantages. And, and although now people are using other alternatives in paint, like zinc or titanium, there are some, some artists that prefer to, to still buy leaded paint because it has some qualities that makes it more attractive to the artists, apparently. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and there's another question, uh, how the neonatals should address lead poisoning uh, in the newborn baby? And is there a minimal, or is there, a, I, I just understand that, is there a, is there a safe, lead level. Uh, Professor Bajania, being a neonatologist, would you like to comment on this? Yeah, absolutely, there is no safe level because uh, as low as three microgram per deciliter have uh, been uh, seen producing the effect. And as the level increases, the effect, adverse effect increases, so absolutely no safe level. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, 
I'm not sure if we have still time because we have questions and uh, it's about the chel chelation therapy. Could that be used uh, with high blood lead levels? Could uh, chelation, yes, Professor O'Reilly, please. Yeah, we're using chelation therapy in, in Zambia, uh, but you have to understand that the lead is stored in the bones in the brain and the chelation therapy can only reduce the blood lead levels so it's binding to the circulating lead in the blood so it's reducing the actual levels but it does not treat the damage done for example if there's a damage done to the neurological system this cannot be repaired so the word therapy is a bit difficult for us as pediatricians. You can treat to a closest, but you cannot treat the effects of a lead intoxication. You can only reduce the actual exposure, which is good. It, it's not, it's a simple treatment. It doesn't cause much side effects, but it's not a causal treatment. So far, so good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would just like to add that uh, for acute lead poisoning, uh, chelation therapy could be effective, but in most of the times in children, the problem is a chronic uh, exposure. And when it has uh, come to a level, as uh, Dr. O'Reilly has uh, just mentioned, it has been stored in uh, especially the central nervous system and uh, it will not be able to take it back uh, from the central nervous system or just uh, reverse the effects uh, on neurodevelopment. Uh, and uh, Dr. Uh, Leslie Onion from WHO uh, has just uh, shared uh, a link about the guidelines of WHO on treatment uh, on this uh, issue. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, we can, uh, we have just come uh, to the end of our uh, webinar. Uh, I would like to thank once uh, again, all uh, speakers uh, for their perfect presentations about the situation uh, in their uh, countries and just demonstrating uh, that taking the appropriate uh, measures are effective in preventing and in decreasing uh, late uh, exposure in children. Uh, so we should uh, share uh, these experiences and uh, try to adapt them uh, to our countries and we should do it at once uh, and we should do it for all uh, children uh, and I would like to take thanks again uh, WHO, UNICEF and IPA for their contribution to the uh, webinar and uh, just leave the uh, stage uh, to IPA uh, admin office again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. Once again, on behalf of the organizing committee, we would like to extend our warmest round of gratitude and appreciation to our keynote speakers, Dr. Desiree Narvaez and Ms. Leslie Onion, as well as to our five honorable speakers. And of course, not to forget to Professor, uh, Professor Osmart as our moderator, as well as to all participants for making this international webinar a great success. So all the participants, please kindly fill in the feedback form as detailed on the slides and ha that has been sent via the Zoom and YouTube chat. The certificate of attendance will be shared via email upon completion of the feedback form. Furthermore, the International Pediatric Association also conducts routine webinars with a wide range of topics concerning child health. To keep yourself up to date, we urge you to follow IPA on our social media platforms as detailed on the slide. We also have several opportunities for you to participate in IPA webinar and activities. First, IPA will be having the IPA Congress next year in 2023. For more details, log on to www.ipa2023congress.org. IPA also provides opportunities for healthcare workers to enroll in the IPA Vaccine Trust course to, to become a certified vaccine champion. The course is open to all healthcare workers for free. Refer to the post and the IPA website for more information. We also have another upcoming webinar on the 2nd of December 2022 entitled Practical Approaches to Improving Teaching and Learning in Busy Clinical Settings. Stay tuned to IPA social media channels for more information. Once again, warmest round of gratitude to all parties who have made this webinar a great success. Thank you, and we hope to see you at the next webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye to everyone. Everyone.
Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you.